I answered that I thought it was a good escape from daily life. I can see that, he agreed. I feel the same. But if I'm escaping a wife or a job or my screaming kids, what is it that you're escaping? Well, I told him, maybe it's not so much what I'm escaping, but rather what I'm seeking. I was lured to Ireland by promises of perhaps the best native trout fishing in the world. The fabled region is called the Connemara, immortalized in the verses of Yeats. It is also a land where the ritual of trout and mayfly is as much a part of the fabric of the people as wool sweaters and whiskey, where they still practice an ancient fishing method called dapping. Yeah, you, you drift with the breeze. And you put three or four mayfly on the hook? Uh, uh, two, two mayfly. Two mayfly. Yeah. And it's just the wind that carries yeah, the, the wind, line out. The wind will carry it out. Oh, that was a bit of line now. <laughs> and you keep, you keep the fly sitting on the water. So the wind is good because it carries the, the line the wind, out. Oh, you have to have breeze for, for the... You have to have a breeze. <laughs> Without the breeze, uh, you cannot dab. Mm -hmm. Walton would have fished flies this way with an 18-foot rod of green heartwood, no reel, and a length of braided horsehair line. That's the mayfly. The bait is two mayflies impaled on a hook, which you make to dance on top of the waves and hope that a trout will take. Dapping is the precursor to fly fishing as we know it. Young schoolboys like Christopher Ford wake early to collect mayflies in wooden boxes that have been passed down through generations. They sell the flies for 50 pence apiece to English noblemen who come to fish the vast locks of Corrib and Mask. Robbie O'Grady remembers collecting mayflies as a child. Do you know what the sight of the mayfly is? He has a peculiar life to put on differently. He spends four years <laughs> run around the bottom and then on this particular day he just moves up and again he's no sooner up and the throw takes him. The adult mayfly only enjoys a day or two of freedom as a winged adult in air before it mates and dies or is swallowed prematurely by a trout. It is one of the more tragic and beautiful life cycles in nature. The idea of such a small fly attracting a large fish to the surface is part of its mystique. I, this is now, this is not a lie, this is gospel dying truth. I was out with my dad way back here to be in about 1947, I'd say, 19. This break him to the water. And just as he was going to take it, the bloody wind blew it about a meter further on. So I just pulled the rod back and I left, and I left it down. And up he comes and he went down. I said for five, ten, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, never seen him. And it was literally being around like a dog on a chain. And we pulled him from, I'd safely say, two miles that way. And then all of a sudden he started to run. And he started to go. And all of a sudden you could see the line coming up like that. And he went straight up and he just within the foot of the water and he went straight down. I hooked that fish at 20 minutes to 4 in the evening. And he broke at 25 minutes to 9. He was that length. He was that tip. I say myself between 14, 15 to 16 pounds weight. But I still can see him, imagine, and that's 60 years ago. I can still see him now in my mind's eye as clear as yesterday. What would Walton's response have been to Robbie O'Grady's story? One of my favorite lines in The Complete Angler. You cannot lose what you never had. And the big trout you got, that was last night. Uh, yesterday evening of Bush, uh, around 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm, yes, and, and that was... Uh, we rose another uh, three or four throws, but uh, sometimes they come up, they see they splash at it, they don't take yeah. it at all. Yeah. At that point, I wasn't worried about losing a fish because I hadn't even hooked one. 
But that was okay, because a big part of this thing called fishing is getting to spend time with people like old Jimmy Foy, who's been a ghillie on Lake Corb for 60 years. As Walton writes through the voice of Piscator to Venator, no life is so happy and so pleasant as the life of a well-governed angler. For when the lawyer is swallowed up in business and the statesman is preventing or contriving plots, we sit on the cowslip banks, hear the birds sing, and possess ourselves in as much quietness as these silent streams. And if I may be the judge, God never did make a more calm, quiet, innocent recreation than angling. On Loch Mask, I fished with a dear Parisian friend named Pierre Afra, formerly a veterinarian and fly casting champion, now a fishing journalist. When you grow older, in the beginning you get competition. You want to catch more fish than it, cast a longer line, try to get fish on the other side of the bank, and, and then you realize that most of the fishing is, is friendship. You know, the people you met while fishing, some of them get your best friend, you know. Nice as it is to be out there on the water with friends, catching fish is still the object. Walton writes in The Complete Angler, I envy not him that eats better meat than I do, nor him that is richer or wears better clothes than I do. I envy nobody but him and him only that catches more fish than I do. If I was a little late on the mayfly hatch, I was two weeks early for salmon fishing. But with all the rain Ireland had seen the previous weeks, the Arif, a spate river, was flowing at a perfect level. With salmon fishing, lots of patience and persistence and a hopeful nature are required. Just bring it out across. Yeah, that's perfect now. Okay. It's just swinging around lovely there now with the current. Jim Stafford knows every pool of the Arif and was kind enough to share his river with me. Okay. Now, all right. Let's go and do a couple of quick casts down this, just in case there's a fish in this one. All okay. right. There weren't many salmon in the river, but Jim hustled me from pool to pool, intent on me catching one. Just keep moving down. We cover as much ground as possible. I became impatient. After two days with Stafford, I was starting to think that salmon fishing was more about great lunches in the cabin than casting in a 30 mile per hour gust pelted by sheets of blowing rain. Then Jim brought us to one last bit of water, what he called the King's Pool. Whoa, take him easy. Take him into the slack water, James. Okay. You come in this side here now into the bank. Make okay. Make run away downstream. Okay. Come in here. Whoa. Get up on the bank? Yeah, I do, yeah. Just keep the tension on the rod. Okay. Keep, keep the tension on the rod the whole time. Take your time now, take your time. He's on the tail fly. Oh, he's a lovely fish. See him turning in the water now. I think we were just about ready to go home, were we? <laughs> Huh? That was definitely the last catch. Amazing. <laughs> I was complaining easy, my no, easy, brains easy. off. Nice and easy. I was just about to say. Oh, look at him! How much I hate salmon fishing. Well, this is your first Irish Atlantic salmon. My first Irish salmon. Well done. <laughs> All right, you got that. Beautiful fish. That is a splendid fish. Oops. Got a sea lice on him. It's just fresh in from the sea. Look. Suddenly I began imagining a man and his sun-freckled face in grey Connemara cloth climbing up to a place where stone is dark under froth and the downturn of his wrist when the flies drop into the stream a man who does not exist a man who is but a dream and cried before I am old I shall have written him one poem maybe as cold and passionate as the dawn William Butler Yeats. <laughs>